Do I now have the whole uh, Indian summer band on the line? Yes. You. Awesome. Okay, so um, we were talking a little bit before about where you guys are from. Um, the two of you are from Northern Virginia, so tell me a little bit, uh, either one of you or both, about what it was like growing up in, in Annandale and uh, how that affected you musically. Go ahead, sir, Steve. Okay. Um, sure. Being from D.C. area, of course, we had a rich history of the bands in the area. All the Discord stuff, Minor Threat, Red Spring, Marginal Man. And that kind of spilled over to us living in the suburbs. We have a little scene out there. So we were surrounded by tons of cool bands, venues to play. And it's one of those things, you get to a certain age, you just want to start playing music yourself. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, so same thing, like, you know, I'm not from Virginia, but, you know, I moved there when I was 10. And so my I have three older brothers, I mean, two older brothers and older sister, and my sister started dating, she was in high school when we moved there, so she started dating, a, getting into punk rock, and dating a guy whose sister was in the DC scene. Uh, she was a drummer for a band, um, eventually became Grand Mall. And so through her boyfriend, I started getting channeled records when I was like 12 and 13. And then my brothers started getting into punk rock. Like They were really into the east, uh, the West Coast scene, like Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, Circle Jerks. So my first exposure to punk rock was more, a little more varied. And then as I grew older and started networking with kids who were skating and into punk rock music, I kind of got aware that the DC scene was really happening. And then, you know, of course, got you know, tapes of uh, Minor Threat and uh, Bad Brains. And as Steve said, you know, as kids got into their teens and started getting really creative, they wanted to be in those types of bands. You know, it's almost a similar story to, like, Ian McKay when he saw Bad Brains for the first time. He's like, I want to be in a band, you know. We went and saw, you know, That Nasty and other kind of mid-'80s bands or, you know, 83, 84, 85 bands. And we all got ex excited and stoked and started networking and, Steve was like, well, I play guitar, and we knew each other from school, and then, you know, we'd find a drummer, and then we'd find a bass player, and kids were just kind of into it, and, you know, we just kind of dove in and tried and experimented, so. What was the difference between uh, what was going on, like, in Annandale close to you versus what was going on uh, in D.C. proper? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, I think in um, – the big thing was, um, I mean, as far as sort of understanding that there were local punk bands, that they existed, um, my middle school, so if I went to Frost, um, there, there was sort of a, um, you know, a, a, a group or, you know, there were loosely a bunch of kids there that were kind of into sort of into skateboarding and surfing and kind of, I think, through that, they got into punk rock. And so there were sort of punk rock kids in the middle school. And I remember there was a kid that had like um, his entire inside of his locker was lined with these very neatly displayed um, black flag postcards, like um, the art for the black, black flag records, which was pretty intense. I mean, if you're in seventh and eighth grade, it was like, wow, um, what is this all about? So there was <clears throat> there was quite a bit of, I mean, there were definitely punk kids there. Um, and then um, I remember kids starting to wear, some of those kids were wearing like government issue t-shirts and I was sort of like, oh, what's, you know, finding out who government issue was. And, and it turned out, I think at the time, John from Government Issue was maybe, you know, his girlfriend was going to, was in the high school, went to Woodson High School, which is right next to our, so I was sort of like, oh, he's like, you know, he's like a local guy. I sort of, you know, it's sort of, I put two and to get two together that that was, you know, this is like a local band that's happening right now. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and I think the thing was, these, you know, these, a lot of these kids had older brothers or older friends and were, were kind of, um, you know, playing playing along, that they, they had not actually seen these bands, but some of them probably had, you know. Um, but 
I think, um, yeah, so that's kind of how I think I became aware of that scene. It was just sort of through my kids in my intermediate school and people, probably by the time I started at, in high school, you know, I'd sort of uh, gotten into skateboarding a little bit and, and other kids that were sort of in that culture would make tapes for each other um, and I was starting to buy buy records. Um, so there was that. And then, you know, there was... <clears throat> also had this really um, <clears throat> influential experience. I mean, I was definitely already into music in sort of the tail end of grade school, grade school, you know, sort of paying attention to, like, what genres were. And, like, you know, I could tell, like, you know, I could tell that I was in, I was interested in, in punk because I liked The Clash. And so I was sort of had my ear to the ground. And then there were sort of new wavy bands that weren't, quite punk but still had kind of a little bit of punk energy at that time um and so and the reason i mentioned this is i remember i think it was my sixth grade graduation a cover band played um with the son of our um our family doctor dr villa vincencio who's like you know would have been a family practitioner <laughs> in, in annandale um and his son's cover band played at my sixth grade graduation and they were they were just like a killer I guess what you'd call like a power pop band like kind of like what you at the time uh, were people use the term like skinny tie band like sort of in that like you know romantics the knack or like um and I think they played some clash songs um and I just remember seeing them in my elementary school, you know, auditorium, and just being, you know, during this party, and everybody else, everybody else is kind of like socializing. I'm like, this band is just crushing it. I mean, they were way better than they needed to be. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To play, to be playing in elementary school graduation, and they were probably in high school. A lot of the kids would go into the city wherever they were having shows at the time. Uh, I don't think it was really until. DSI records started getting a little larger with their band, United Mutation, and and had a couple other groups on their label. I have a little Northern Virginia scene, scene start creeping up. But a lot of the kids back then would just hit the shows that were more of the Arlington, D.C. crowd. And probably uh, it wasn't until, like, I don't know, 84, 85, that Northern Virginia started getting more shows. Yeah. Were you... Yeah. With- I was going to say, I was going to add on to that, but, you know, going into D.C. was kind of a big deal when you were 14, 15, you know, as suburbanites who, you know, most parents were like, oh, you don't want to go into D.C., it's so scary, you know. (laughs) And then, you know, then you kind of realize, well, there's all these D.C. bands, they all live there, and they're not getting killed, they're not getting, you know, beat up and stuff, you know. So I kind of started realizing, and also through, like, meeting those people in the D.C. scene and realizing that, you know, shows at the Wilson Center were put on by those people um we realized you know people like the guys in dc dsi records they started putting on shows in like vfw halls and little community centers around northern virginia and that kind of really kind of fostered uh, getting more of the kids into it i had pretty much the exact same experience but a few hundred miles north in the suburbs and heading into new york city cbgb's the old rich rock hotel on east 11th street um then things started branching out um, the old uh, Anthrax Club, originally in Stanford, then South Norwalk. So it's a little, little different type of music, um, but we were pretty familiar with the D.C. town from up there. One of the first shows I actually ever saw in New York City was uh, Circle Jerks, and opening from them was that nasty. So introduced the D.C. guys early. And, and Bill, what were, the, what were the bands that you were most into up there? Oh, God, back then, geez. Um, well, a lot of the big names, the California games, the Circle Jerks, stuff like that, Black Flag, um, local guys, youth of, from the same town as youth of today, and that whole big X on the hand, straight edge movement, and that northern, northeast scene. Um, big bands like, like, all I say, Fear, stuff like that. I came in with a little bit more of a, more of a hardcore background and liking so steve had to introduce me to the dc way so i was i was in this <clears throat> you know funky accelerated program in fairfax county school one of the kids in my neighborhood that was art also in the program 
was a really smart kid um, and had older brothers who were into music. And he was buying um, these British music magazines like Star Hits and um, and he was buying lots of punk and new wave records that really even just way before most people I knew were aware of them at all. I mean, I remember he, you know, was like he had records by the damned and um, <clears throat> joy division and all this stuff that was pretty exotic. But if you picked up these British um, music magazines, which I think were not that hard to find, you know, you could find them at the drugstore, they wrote about all those bands. So it was kind of like he had figured out <clears throat> how to access that information. Um, and that was pretty, that was in middle school or, you know, that was in eighth grade. And then, you know, we, he and I went to different high schools, but I used to like <clears throat> borrow, borrow things from him or tape things from him. Um, just a kid in my neighborhood. So I did a lot of taping too. I just, you know, I got into taping music from people. And then I think just, because at my high school, there was sort of like a group, you know, a group of kids that obviously were interested in music that gradu- gravitated toward each other and um, met a few guys uh, in that um, at, at Paul VI High School, and they knew I was interested in, in playing the drums. I don't think I'd quite bought the drum kit yet, um, so we got together a few times in the guitar player's basement in Burke. Um, and he, you know, I think we did like, we started out trying to learn like Sex Pistols and Joe Jackson songs. Um, and he had a kit. I did. We didn't have a kit yet. I was like playing, I think I was playing on like some, um, some like, uh, kitchen stools, like some <laughs> like stand up stools that had like, plastic dots on them like the first couple times and then I was like alright I'm need. i just going to buy a, a drum kit I had a couple like drum pads like practice pads but and then I brought a, bought a drum kit and we just I played with those guys for like a year or two just mainly in our basements so where did you guys um, first rehearse and where did when did you know that you officially had a band yeah, I was, it was probably, it was summer 87, I was at a beach trip out in Rehoboth, Delaware, and I was skateboard, skating around the town, and ran into a couple other guys, and it turned out that they were from back in Northern Virginia, and specifically, John, who was one of the guys, he said he was in Andale, we started talking, he was no more than a mile away from the house, he was a drummer, and he said, oh, I got a guitar, so when we get back home, let's get together and start jamming, and we played around. Got a couple of guys in the neighborhood you know, sitting for bass and, and we talked to Pat. I got him to come and do vocals and this is before Bill had joined. We had a different bass player at the time and we just started playing. So this was essentially yeah. August eighty seven. That was the newbie. Yeah, we started like in the summer. I, I do remember I think just um you know, Steve and I played a couple times. Um we recruited Sam and then I think Pat Best was recruited next. Um, and I do remember it came together, you know, pretty quickly. We didn't bother, you know, one thing that was interesting was we just worked on our own material. So that was kind of the new, the new facet of it is that it was new material. Um, I mean, I think the thing about Steve uh, that to this day is he's, you know, he's very like sort of, um, Soul oriented and can be very like you know, even though he likes to goof around. Like as far as the band was concerned, he's very like kind of like let's get down to business. So we, you know, we got a bunch of songs together. I think the first party we played, and this is where it kind of comes full circle in a funny way. It's like I think we played like a Woodson High School, you know, a bunch of kids from Woodson High School, and somebody was having some bash with a bunch of bands, and so. We're, we get over there and playing, and that's, then there's like a bunch of the kids in the audience are people that I went to intermediate school but hadn't seen in, you know, three years um, or two or three years. And uh, some of those kids that were like the first kids I ever saw sort of wearing punk rock T-shirts <laughs> were, were in the audience 
but no longer into punk rock. Um, but anyway, the, uh, I just remember it being like really, that was extra stressful because I was like, wait, I know all these people like from my past. Um, but yeah, I think we, we quickly went from like playing the part, you know, playing parties, um, to, uh, you know, trying to get proper shows and the, um, we played at the, uh, I mean, really probably one of the coolest places. And I'm sure you've documented this on the, on the podcast, um, the Maryfield, um, community hall punk shows of the eighties were, were really <clears throat> important to me. That was probably, actually, I think I saw, it was like a government issue show and it was probably right when we were starting Indian summer. And that was like one of the first shows where I considered it like, you know, where I felt like, Oh, I'm at a real, this is a real punk rock show or this is a real hardcore show or whatever. Even though I think, um, government issue by that time but they were kind of like a post-punk band like they're much more of like a you know they weren't they weren't like uh you know they weren't playing like the super fast thrash stuff they were playing much more sophisticated music um but that was like a real show with like there were people slam dancing and i was like whoa this is really this is really the whole you know this is the whole thing like this is this is pretty raw Was that Indian summer? Was that a, a reference to the fact that you guys started during the summer and then it like carried over? <laughs> you know, before you answer this one, Steve, I've actually had several people since this reunion thing come up <laughs> ask about the name and they know why it was named that. And my stock answer is generally, I have no idea. <laughs> like <laughs> the Doors, man. It was it was it was it was it was named before I joined, and honestly, I don't think I ever asked. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think there's any really like thought behind it so much. Like, okay, it's I don't know, seems cool, nothing to pick. Indian summer. So the Indian summer is, if, if if I know it or or if I remember the reference, it's just when summer, like when the um, the warmth of summer carries over into those later months. So it, you know, the warmth warmth of summer carries over into September and, and October. It's kind of yeah, it's like one of those period of hazy, unseasonably high temperatures and whatever period. And we'd actually had that one of our early T-shirts that we made on like the, the front of the shirt, like the, that um, description of Indian summer. Yeah. When I think of our music, I think warm and cuddly and cozy cocoa by the fire. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I, also, I think of you know Indian summer more like the namesake, and that it's just you know. An unseasonably, uh, unseasonably or unexpected change in weather, you know, <laughs> after when you expect something to be normalized. So, but but I mean, it is interesting that you're you're citing that you went on vacation, you met up with with these other guys, you know, you came back, formed the band, and it just kind of kept going. Like what you had done during the summer, just kept going mm-hmm. and going for the next few months so it, it is interesting that you pick that as your name even if you didn't do that intentionally because right. uh, you know that that narratively that's what happened interesting good way of putting it yeah <laughs> <That is> just- <laughs> i like it let's go with that let's uh, go ahead. i like it print put it in print yeah use that for the book Pat, did you did you know you could sing before you joined the band? Had oh, you, I'm not sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I could I could scream a little bit. I was practiced at screaming. So, <laughs> did, did you have a background in singing at all? Did you have a background as a front man before you joined the band? Right. No. Prior to poetry, prior to joining the band. 
from the writing side, yeah, you know, I enjoyed poetry and writing and that creative aspect, but singing, no. I just kind of took the DIY, you know, approach of, you know, the whole idea of punk is that you just get in there and bash it out however you you can. And that was kind of my ethos. Just go for it. Yeah, Pat, didn't you take a stab at, like, this other band I was in prior to Indian Summer as vocalist? Yeah, I did. I think, yeah, it was that, uh, with Bill Boyne, the drummer. All right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, I think I did it once, and then, I don't know if I was before Adam or after Adam. But that's, yeah. how, that's how the guys knew that you'd be the, the guy to go to, or the guy that would be able to do this? I don't know if I was oh. the guy to go to, but I was willing and able. Yeah, it's one of those, you know... Guy, you know, he likes skateboarding. He likes this kind of music. It's funny. Yeah. Let's, you know, have him come over. And plus, we were, you know, we we're in the same high school uh, when we were starting out, and it was kind of there's a certain amount of convenience, honestly, of like we're friends who hung out and skated, and let's like just fucking do it after school and just have fun. You know, we weren't like it wasn't like a big rock thing. We're like we're putting up flyers. Hey, we're looking for a new bass player. Must be influenced by X, Y, and Z. It's like, hey, we're friends. We can have make some noise. Yeah, I don't think we're that sophisticated. <laughs> no. And then how yeah. Gene Simmons joined Kiss, or is it <laughs> Peter Chris? One of them. Flyers joined by Flyer. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. So my point is that we were just, you know, we were friends, and we all knew each other from the little skate scene and high school, and so we just kind of, you know, and there weren't that many kids into punk rock even in our high school you know it was a small group yeah i can um, say the same about up north too we were uh quite few and far between yeah so it was more of a like-mindedness that drew each other to in the band so did you feel harassed as like skaters and and punks by you know the forces that be the the, the parents or um the the cops or anybody else the straight uh we did a little bit, yeah. I can't. I don't know about these guys down here, but for sure there was some of that, definitely. Well, definitely from the skateboarding side, you know, like there were a lot of rednecks in our area who would, you know, throw shit at us. We were skating by at the strip mall or like well, trying to jump. I can tell you for sure that redneck is not a southern domain. I mean, that's, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I was just saying our rednecks, our local rednecks. <laughs> Yours or worse, sir? Yeah, we I mean, we played one party, Pat. We got run out of the house by those guys just because we were kind of punk band and skaters. Yeah, but as, as far as like skating, you get the eye rolling like it is now, where everybody, their mothers, skateboarding down the street. It was there was like a rebel activity back then. There wasn't a lot of people doing it. Yeah, well, we definitely got kicked out of places by. Some I mean, God forbid, God skaters. forbid, back then you had you know tattoos or a weird place pierced or different color hair. Oof, yeah, no doubt. Unlike today, now you get ostracized if you don't. <laughs> exactly. So where did you guys play your first your first gig? Uh, was it a basement? Yeah, party? it was. Um, I think we go like the neon party, with this yeah. basement house party back in '87. And and what songs were you doing? Were you doing the the same stuff that that's on the record or? No, it was all new stuff, nothing from the record. A lot of covers back then, you know, traditional, throw you Louie Louie together, Pipeline. But which ones are covers? What on the record? Which ones did you guys already have written before I joined? Uh, no, why Time, was for you, after... Time for You is an early song. That, that one definitely. Yeah. But we didn't play it was after. Sherry yeah. Smash was after. Yeah, but looking back at all the songs we did, it's amazing how like that that many we had. Yeah. It's kind of evolved over time. You get better and you weed them out and get some different ones coming in. Yeah. Why is what I was trying to speed you guys up a little bit? <laughs> <laughs>
so that Maryfield Community Hall, we that was kind of um, for Indian Summer. That was a big opportunity because once we sort of had our act together um, and had some songs, I think we got some. We, we were um, we got a, help, a lot of help from Richard Gibson from from MFD. Um, so I think he maybe got us our first or helped get us a, a show at Maryfield Community Hall. Um, and so we ended up playing there twice. And maybe it might have been with, <clears throat> I think, with, with the two different lineups, Vinny and Summer. I'm pretty sure. We played one show with um, Ignition and, uh, I want to say MFD. I mean, I have, fl- I have flyers for these somewhere. Dig them up. Um, and then we played another show with uh, Shudder to Think. So, and that was huge because those were bands that, that, at the time in high school, I just you know I saw those bands play a lot and just looked up to them and thought they were magical. I mean, they're still you know I I still appreciate both of those bands <clears throat> in totally different ways. But um, you know, Ignition was sort of had this you know real dark and um you know almost like industrial like approach to um punk And, and Shudder to Think has had a whole different sort of, <laughs> um, you know, like flamboyant and, um, yeah, just super colorful. And, and, and they were, you know, the early, earlier Shudder to Think was super energetic. I mean, later they kind of like became a little more glam rock in, in, a, in a really cool way. But their first record, their first couple records are really you know, fast and Mike Russell was like an awesome drummer. Like really loved watching him play. My my older brother knew knew uh, Rich and uh, the Fox Brothers through the punk scene too. So I don't know if that helped. <laughs> so, but it was just kind of an evolution. You know, I think it's one of those things where we got good enough where Rich would be like, "All right, yeah, fuck, you guys can play. You know, let's do it." And we weren't just at, it wasn't like our first show was at you know a, a bigger bill. So we just kind of I think our first year we spent mostly just playing house parties and then what Arlington uh, women's hall, we got a show there and then Maryfield, I believe. So there's kind of network too. It takes time to kind of meet people. Yeah. And yeah. Try I don't know if you knew this, and... Pat, um, I was with Rich when he was an MFD, they were like a three piece. They needed to send you in the Oh really? 
to come audition for a few practices, which I did, and I thought I was going to have to go up to Philly or Trenton and play a show they were doing with GIs, but I ended up getting somebody else, thank God. Oh, I think I could have learned all those songs. <laughs> nice. Then, um, you know, we really wanted to play a proper DC club. I think that was the other sort of thing that we were trying to make happen. Um, and we eventually, uh, I, I don't remember all the sort of ins and outs of it, but we ended up, it was a bizarre situation. I think we ended up playing the Safari Club, but we, um, one of the reasons we were interested in playing there is someone had run an ad, like, in the city paper or something, and it had listed us and these other bands playing at the Safari Club, and none of us were actually <clears throat> booked to play there. And But it made us think, oh, well, maybe we should play there. Um, and it was a little bit, I think it was a weird situation at first, because they were, you know, we didn't really have a huge following in the city, and the, <clears throat> I think they tried to, like, charge us to to pay the sound man or something the first time we play, played. And I I don't remember being aware of this, or I did certainly didn't have any money, so I didn't pay anybody. But um, we might have had to pay the sound man just to get play our first show. But then, once we'd done that, I think a lot of other things opened up for us, and we um, we played like a DC space coffee, like a, what they call the Positive Force Coffee House. That was um, a pretty big show for us, and. <clears throat> Our other sort of thing was that we, we were friends with these um, women that lived in St. Mary's County that did a zine called No Scene Zine, and they um, did shows in St. Mary's County. They did a pretty awesome music festival there, um, which we were hoping to get on the bill for, and we, we didn't actually get on the bill, but we <laughs> we actually drove out there uh, just, just to see if we could, and, but we ended up there, there was no room for us, but it was like it was a really great um, festival. This little amphitheater and um, Electric Love Muffin played, which were a great band from Philadelphia. And I think Moss, I think I saw Moss Icon play, which were I believe they're from Annapolis. They were from Annapolis, um, <clears throat> but that was a great show. And so we we and then later we I think we ended up going out and playing St. Mary's Fairgrounds. But we befriended some bands um, through them, and so we, we used to play with this band called Out Crowd a lot, and we played with this band called Images a lot. And um, a couple of the guys from those bands are now in this um, pretty big pop punk band called H2O. <laughs> so if you hear of H2O, those guys were were old old school Maryland. Um, Punkers. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of our last, our last show was one of our, I think, our best shows, actually. You know, we played with Shudder to Think at DC Space, you know, was, which for was us, so much fun. it was fun. And, you know, I was like 17. It was kind of a dream to play at that space, you know, and kind of somewhat ignorant about how clubbing, uh, booking shows work in, in big cities. But, you know, that was definitely a highlight. Because I think, too, artistically, as a band, we were just, we were on fire. and We were really hitting it. So, you know. Um, going backwards in time, I think the show, um, gosh, I'm, there's so many like little bands that we played with who are really great players. I just can't remember any of them. I never went anywhere. They were just like high school one-off bands too. Um, I don't know, Steve, you got some traction on that? Uh, fun shows. I mean, I liked uh, the crazy place. We played that barn out in St. Mary's County. Oh, oh yeah, my was, God. It was like yeah. three degrees. Yeah. Couldn't feel the strings. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That was an uh, out crowd, right? Uh, electric Love Muffin, out crowd. Yeah. I'm also curious uh, when you were trying to break into the, the D.C. or Maryland scene, did you see 
feel um, at all self-conscious about being from Northern Virginia, or did you feel, you know, like there was some kind of invisible barrier to, to you know, crossing over to, into that? Um, yeah, I think I did at the time. I think I did have – I had this, you know, this this idea that – you know, I, I had sort of mistaken ideas about what the people in the D.C. punk scene were like. You know, I mean, was all, I was only in high school. I didn't, I, I sort of, you know, um, you know, just had my imagination, you know, made, made them out to be a very different kind of people. But I think that what what sort of happened is that we, <clears throat> as we progressed with Indian Summer, um, we played with, um, well, we played with Swizz and we played with Ignition and played with bands like the Vile Cherubs and stuff. And those those were all kids that were pretty much <clears throat> in the center of the DC punk scene. I mean, they were bands that were on Discord or friendly with Discord, and everybody was super cool. You know, I mean, it, it, there, you know, there was really no attitude. <laughs> So I think that was one of those things where it was sort of like it was um, if there was any sort of social anxiety, I it got over it um, when I was in high school, and I also sort of realized, oh, lots of these people are from Maryland or Northern Virginia. You know, there's not not everybody in these bands lives in D.C. Um, so that yeah, that was sort of like um, yeah, I think I sort of figured that out partly through high school. It's like it doesn't you know through through Indian summer like no one really cares where you actually live. Um, and I think we'd like Steve and I had been handing out flyers in D.C. and uh, Fred, the guitar player from Beefeater, came up and talked to him, and I was like. You know, that's like the that's the most rock and roll looking dude I had ever seen in my life. I mean, he was completely covered in you know black leather and metal studs and had motorcycle boots on and was like the friendliest guy ever. So it was you know sort of like lots of those things were just sort of for a suburban kid like you know just revelations that oh people you know I don't know people in this music scene are generally you know, very um, friendly and supportive. And that's really my experience through my 20s as well. Like, living in the city is that D.C., you know, in general, it's a very supportive music music scene. I'm in, I would say, Chicago, There's it's much more competitive and there's much more... Uh, I hear, and you know, there's, there's just more of a music industry here, and there's more uh, rivalries, and maybe it's also just a different time, you know, it's a different era. But um, DC in the late '80s, and and for most of the '90s, when I was there, it was very supportive, you know, and people were really, uh, really supportive of pretty much. Everything I was I was involved in, whether it was really whether it was good or not, being people seemed pretty interested. <laughs> so, um, so, so you've talked a lot about playing live shows. Um, was recording music important to you also? Yeah, I mean that was all. You know, again, I mean I was so young. I mean that was all new to me. Um, the, you know the process and everything. Definitely, that was very. I'd say probably the most intimidating um, part part of uh, playing in Indian Summer was we um, <clears throat> went and we recorded with a guy named Skip, long-haired guy, um, and his name has been, his last name has been lost to time. I have photos of him, but I, I cannot remember his name. Um, but I think we, I think he originally came over and recorded us on you know just like a like a Tascam port studio in my basement, um, 
And one of the songs that we got out of that um, time for you was on a couple different cassette compilations that came out in that era. Uh, there's one called DC Metro Mayhem. And I think there's another cassette compilation that I have that was like a like a like all over not all well, mostly Northern Virginia, but I think there were some Richmond bands on there. Um, so that and I, I think the time for you actually was pretty good. It turned out <clears throat> pretty well. He did a good job on that. And the next time we went to go record with him, I think we went to his house, and we tried to do a bunch of songs that we just really hadn't figured out yet. So um, they're really just very loose demos. And some of the uh, there's a couple of those that are on the uh, the Indian Summer 12 inch, but those were really just sketches of songs. Like we we had we had songs that were much further along than those, but for some reason, when we went to record, we, you know, I think this happens to me, you're like, let's record our newest thing, you know, and it's, even though you don't really, even though maybe it's not really ready, so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for for a guy with, like, a Porta studio, I think he had a lot of outboard gear and decent microphones, and he, he definitely knew what he was doing um, much more than we did. <laughs> so, um, and then... The, I don't know if, if the other guys have shared the story. So I think we somehow, through our friend Jason Kukin, um, got in touch with Jay Robbins, who was, who was in um, Government Issue at the time, and sort of um, asked if he could produce our recording. And I don't think he'd seen us yet. Um, but... Um, I do remember that we were playing a party, um, someone's birthday party, with, when we were playing with images in Maryland, suburban Maryland, and we were kind of, whatever room we were in, maybe it had high feelings or something, but we sounded so good, like we sounded huge in this in this room, um, and I just, you know, I was really like amped up, and I remember partway through, we're just having a really good night. And then I saw Jay Robbins like walk in. And I was like, oh, this is good. <laughs> he might, he's seeing us like actually like, you know, like playing our, our very best. Um, I, I don't think he stuck around, but um, so <clears throat> we basically convinced him to produce this. And he did a little bit of, um, I guess what you call pre-production where he came over to my house um, and he had gotten some tips from the drummer from Squirrel Bait on drum tuning. And so basically came over and we totally uh, retuned my drum kit, um, made it sound a lot better. And then, uh, I don't know, like a, maybe like a week or so later, we did uh, we went up to Baltimore and recorded... Um, with this guy named Joe Crunch, and it was sort of like a, a, a studio where they usually did um, radio spots. So they did, um, you know, they would do uh, 
maybe like radio ads or I, I don't know exactly what they, it was just a small sort of studio probably not um optimized for recording rock bands but um yeah i just remember i was just unbelievably nervous and wound up about that <laughs> session even though i knew the songs really well um so there's a couple points on the recording where i'm like oh that's just me having nerves and freaking out it's not that i <laughs> don't know how to play the song so but i think it actually you know i think it turned out pretty well i mean there's there's certainly like um i think there's there's pros and cons like there's there's a lot of just crazy drumming that i i can't believe that i was trying that i was attempting when i was at 17 and then there's just things that to me i'd obviously would have done a lot better or differently, you know, being, being that someone who's been playing drums a lot longer. But I had, you know, I had to listen to that recording a lot lately when we were getting ready for the reunion show. And it just, I, it really, I don't know, I think it charmed me. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot about it that's really cool. So um, I didn't listen to it for many years and now I'm like, wow, kind of, an amazing document, and I can't sort of can't believe that I did that when I was 17, and when those guys were 18. Well, I can tell you how I knew John Stones a little bit. Um, he was actually dating a girl in my high school, <laughs> so he was like in his 20s, and she was like, careful what you admit here. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how what the relationship was like, but he would be hanging out at our high school. Like I think it was my junior or senior year, I can't remember. But I would talk to him when he was just chilling <laughs> with his girlfriend. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But I don't know actually how we got connected up with Jay. I think that's more through Steve and John, I believe. So. Yeah, I think um, our friend Jason was friends with Jay. So he kind of hooked us up together. Came out to see us at some party that we're playing and I guess all right you want to come help us record so we recorded with him mm-hmm. yeah for us that was a bit of a hike just to go record crunch sounds yeah because yeah. we never played any shows in Baltimore so there wasn't really much happening for punk scenes up there so I think we got hooked up with those with uh, that studio through the out crowd crew if I remember correctly yeah, they're the same engineer as the one that produced their first record. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a, it was a professional studio, I guess, similar to Inner Ear, you know, at that time. It's like, you know, 24 track. I think, was it 16 track or 24 track? I can't remember. But, you know, it's like really good mics, you know, a really good sounding room. You know, for all of us, it was, for me personally, it was a little intimidating. Cause I'm like, oh, man, this is cool. I got to plug yeah. directly into the board instead of my shit ass amp. So it actually sounded yeah. decent. Yeah. Yeah, they just tell you what to do when you do it. You know, you don't have prior experience with the studio, so it's like I walk us through everything. Yeah, so there's a definitely learning curve. Like, you know, I worked. Jay was really generous and worked with me on like how to like sing a bit clearer and straighter and not you know make extra noises when I was singing that get picked up in the the recording because I was doing these deep breaths that were getting picked up between like lines when I was singing. So I think for that for us it was you know a steep learning curve you know, within a, within a few hours, just trying to get like the right drum sounds, the right singing, a clarity, you know, guitar sounds, you know, we, Jay was giving us a lot of tips on how GI recorded things too. So we kind of leaned on him and, and Joe to kind of guide us. Is there anything now when you listen back that you wish that you could have done differently? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, oh, there's, where do we begin? There's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of flubs that I can hear. They're like, oh, I really should have done that one again. Yeah. Yeah, I was more thinking just that some of the you know, last material that we wrote, we would have that recorded. Probably. I think overall, this, the guitars were too damn loud, but that's because we let Steve go back the next day and do the remix by himself. I think they say they <laughs> ended up erasing something that I did, so I had to go back like two weeks later to fix it. Oh, that's right. That's, I remember that. So. I think they did a hell of a job on the remix. That yeah. sounded really good. Well, I think it's just a testament to how well it's recorded in the first place, you know, because if it's not recorded well in the, to begin with, it, you can't, it's hard to resurrect, you know, a bad recording so, or clean up a bad recording. So, 
Um, but as far as like doing things differently, you know, it's, you know, it's been 30 years since we recorded that and it's, where do you, where do you pick it apart? You know, it's, it's a little unfair in that sense, you know, cause we, I wish, as like Steve said, we wish we captured more of the songs that we do, but you know, limited funds and time. Like for the first day, I think we paid like 70, 80 bucks. And I had to go back and do some overdubs. So later, it wasn't like another 40, 50 bucks. It wasn't much at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like Jay was uh, like killing us for his time or right? anything. Like, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't have, have charges for that. There's exactly. like studio time. Jesus, that's great. How did it pick it apart? What, when you listen, when you listen to the songs now, what are you excited about hearing? Well, I, I love the guitar playing personally. So, as because I, I, when I left the band, I started learning to play guitar, and I've played guitar since then. And you know, I think Steve's guitar playing is just really great. So, bass playing is pretty good too, you know. But, <laughs> but I think what I really like is it's been nice that I had a couple of years to learn how to play bass before we did. That. That's true. But you know, I think the bass player, the bass playing, and the uh, guitar playing are so interactive to each other. There's the bass playing is very melodic, so it plays with the. Um, the interplay between the bass and guitar is really sweet. Far better than I remember. And John and I actually had it had along pretty well too, as far as keeping together, yeah. keep that rhythm section going. True. Which was new for me, staying to a more melodic tone than stuff I grew up with. So I liked it. It was different. It was fun. Yeah, it's definitely a little more poppier than I remember, but that's what it good. Is that is that something that you would have had to to live down within the scene at that time? <laughs> That's something that you know you're you're more proud of that set you apart. Well, I would say you know it's it was you know of the moment it was us capturing our you know our zeitgeist I guess you would say you know because you know four three or four years later pop became really uh, punk became very poppy you know. So like with Green Day and all those guys. Yeah, we were never really the the one, two, three, four straight up hardcore stuff. No. And yeah, surprise like that that review back in Maximum Rock and Roll when we first did the cassette. It said it's like upbeat melodic punk with a slight pop edge. So I mean that's mm-hmm. like pop punk review back in eighty eight, eighty nine. Yeah. I think it meshed really well with everything that was going on around D C at the time. I don't know how well it would have translated to New York City, where they really liked more of that harder, hardcore edge stuff. Yeah. I think for the D.C. area, it was pretty spot on. Yeah.
getting back to, to naming stuff, um, Cherry Smash, that is uh, a, a drink, if I'm uh, <laughs> yeah. right, that, that's like a, kind of a generic Cherry Cola. Yeah, that's the one. I had actually, I had actually never heard of it before I had actually played the song. I think it's a southern. It's only available like in North Carolina, right? Like it's your one. Somewhere it's, it's definitely regional. I don't know. I thought it was like yeah, Rock Creek Brewing Company or something out here local. But mm-hmm. yeah, I was, I was thinking about. It. I was wondering if that is, you know, that's got that's definitely East Coast, regardless. Like, there's no way anybody on the West Coast has any idea what you're talking about. No, no, no way. <laughs> but uh, but the words stuff is good together regardless. It's like Indian summer, even if you don't know what it is, you know, the the, the words themselves have some interesting connotations. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, well, were you, was there a lot of... <laughs> Consuming a lot of Cherry Smash in the studio was one of you like uh, more of a, a Cherry Smash connoisseur. No, I'm not I sure was... I've actually ever had it. Yeah, so the story behind that one, we were at a show at Safari Club, and between bands, we went over next door. There's one of those markets there, and I got this Cherry Smash, and gave it to my girlfriend at the time. Did tell her what it was, and she didn't drink alcohol, so it was one of those things like, well, you try this. It was like joking around that there might have been alcohol in there. So that was the whole thing about Cherry Smash, read the lyrics. Okay. I literally just learned that just now. There you go. That's <laughs> So we, we made this uh, recording. We kind of used it as a tape to get shows, <clears throat> like the Positive Four show. And... um. There was a little, I think Amanda McKay was a little bit interested in us, but she, you know, she was really just starting her label and we were um, not going to last as a band because of, you know, college and um, I think Steve and Pat had some kind of falling out the last um, summer that we were playing together and they just didn't want to play it together anymore. Um, but uh, so at the, at the time, it was a disappointment because we really thought somebody's going to put this out, you know, on a 7-inch. But um, in retrospect, it's just it's cool that we actually recorded anything at all and that, you know, it's, it's, and now you can buy it on a record, which is just kind of crazy to me. And that and that's the last recording that you guys did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess yeah. We didn't um, we didn't follow it up. I I don't. I could have to look at like a timeline to see, in terms of um, how uh, how long after we did that uh, did we split up? I mean, we there's there's a funny little ending to Indian Summer that is slightly embarrassing for me, but I, I have to share it because I think it's indicative of, of the kind of person I was at the time. But um, So when Steve and Pat decided, okay, we can't, we're not getting along, we're, we're, we're not going to play anymore, we had a couple shows booked, a, a, a party um, in the friend's basement, I think in Manassas area, and then a show at... Barbecue de Guana. Has anyone mentioned the Barbecue de Guana in, in no. your podcast? No. Oh my God. Oh, geez. that is that's all right. So this the Barbecue de Guana was a really bizarre club off 14th Street. It might have been like 14th and P, and it was really on a street that had been <clears throat> uh, suffered, um, you know, a lot of damage and and never been sort of reinvested in off 14th Street at the time. So it, it, it was, you know, it was, on a, it was on a block with, like, a lot of empty lots. But it was this strange club, and they had a stage that was, like, six feet, you know, five feet high, six feet high. Um, 
And yeah, and Indian Summer played there a couple times. But so we had these last two shows, and I was just like, I just didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to play these shows. So <clears throat> I recruited sort of two guys that were friends of our band. That um, a guy named Jim Wallbelig and a guy named um, anyway, I recruit, recruited a, um, a couple friends, and we, you know, basically we learned like five Indian summer songs and then the um, guitar player had some other songs he wanted to do. We we, <laughs> we put, pulled together a set and um, Matt Manning, I'm sorry, the singer is Matt Manning. And we, uh, and th- these guys, you know, they, they were, they were like friends of ours in the area. I could, good musicians. I mean, Jim Wildbillick was a fabulous guitar player and singer. Um, could have easily been a professional musician. Um, but anyway, I just, I was at that time, I was sort of like, well, I don't want to just cancel these shows, you know, like, I don't want to miss out on this experience before I go away. And so we went and we played these shows and we played fine. Um, Matt had a little bit of stage fright and, you know, wasn't like the most, did engage with the audience a lot, but it, you know, we, whatever, we, we got through. Okay. But in the end, I was kind of, just kind of like, you know, that wasn't really Indian summer. It was like something else, and I should have changed the name or something. You know, I mean, I sort of felt like I had done something um, inappropriate, and uh, not that anyone cared, but it was like I wished I had given it a different name or or even just canceled shows. But, you know, whatever. At the time, I was like, I'm not going to. I don't want to miss a thing. I want to like, if we have a show booked, I'm going to show up and play. So, um, but anyway, that, those were the last two Indian summer shows and they were, so they were probably, they didn't leave people, you know, <clears throat> they weren't legendary. I mean, they were fun, but it wasn't like, it wasn't the same kind of thing, you know? And, and, uh, so anyway, if I have any, if I have one regret, it's kind of that, the way I did that, I would have done it differently. Because you didn't get a proper release. It was like a cassette, kind of shopping that around and ended up breaking up. People went to different schools and that was kind of the end of the band. And then just over the years, I started thinking about it and just didn't really get traction until finally, like, you know what, let me try to track down the master tapes and made some calls, finally got the studio where Rhythm recorded in Baltimore, tracked them down and they surprised me they had the original tape. So, had that sent off to get it restored. So up to the guys at Iron Mountain, they went ahead and restored the tape, digitized it for me. And then that's where we brought in Tom Lyle, who was in GIs, to do the remastering. So we sent him the, the digital recordings. He remastered everything. It's like, okay, we got that stuff done. So let's figure out how to do, get the record cut. So talk to the, got the lucky lockers it was kind of by pathway in wisconsin he did the he cut it really loud so it sounded good when we finally pressed it and found a couple of places to do pressing and settled on this place down in florida pressed the record released it so right let's try to do a show on this it's you know that's the whole point we have a record out let's try to you know, get a show to promote it and six were, months later we had the show were you guys too- when he came, when he came to you with this idea? Oh yeah, I thought he was crazy. I thought he was kidding. <laughs> and like just a couple of months into it, I was like, "Holy shit, he's serious!" <laughs> no, Let's I do was this for it. Yeah, yeah, this is great. It's great. I mean, I literally had to learn how to play again. Wow! I had to go buy, I had to go buy a new bass. And I had to, I had to learn to sing again. <laughs> but did, did you though? Did you though? Did I? Did you? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> So how did you guys do this? How did you how did you rehearse for this? You rehearse separately <laughs> over the internet? Like... Yeah, me, me and Steve would send stuff back and forth and try to figure out, try to remember things, give each other hints and help over a couple months previous. So we practiced like video of where we're playing apart. on the on the fretboard and. Yeah. Just kind of like, okay, everyone's going to listen to the same due to the recordings that we had other records, and we're kind of consistent there. We joked about Figure that on a Skype practice several times. It just never actually happened. Yeah. But surprisingly, you know, trying to learn 
bunch of originals and then throwing brand new covers to the mix. It's uh, <clears throat> pretty impressive that we we're able to do all that. Yeah, totally. Without, well, without Steve, you've been your current band, Destroy All Monsters. Is that what it is? No Dead Monsters. No Dead Monsters, sorry. Destroy All Monsters, another band, sorry. <laughs> Uh, no Dead Monsters. You've been playing, so it's not like you pick up a guitar for right. yeah. years, so which was I think you know helped out a lot. Yeah, I didn't have the dust that that Bill had. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've still been playing guitar on and off for the years, just but you know never more than ten minutes at a time every few months. So. Yeah, you know, we're joking with Bill. It's like, all right, do we just give him one string to play on the bass? Do we just <laughs> turn him down the whole time. But, well, I, I, honestly, I, for a while, I thought they were going to give me the Sid Vicious treatment where they just didn't even plug the bass in. Just had like somebody else playing it behind a curtain somewhere. But did we end up doing that, Pat? <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> I probably should have. I almost fell off the stage once. That would have been hilarious. I would have taken out the whole PA if I had gone down. It's true. I think it's, I mean, there's a lot of bands. That's the first thing. It's almost oversaturated with bands. And so you're just competing with every other group out there for other shows or just venues. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people are apparently heading to Baltimore to see bands. A lot of the bands skip DC altogether when they come through on their tours. So I don't know. I mean, just, we've found a lot of places to play, but it just, the, the crowd is, like it used to be where there's this nice little tight knit community where they seem to know each other I don't know this music is more accessible now you just want to get on the internet you want to find out about a band and you just decide whether or not you want to go out and see them otherwise in the old days you'd talk to your friends and say come on out tonight and you go see a band so I didn't really have another way to figure it out before what? also DC has changed so much since the 80s you know just economically, socially, you know, there's not, you know, not outside of the internet itself, you know, in that way of communication, just the, the area has changed so dramatically. So I still think there's kind of the teenaged angst that she used to be, you know, it's harder to rebel, I suppose. Ah. And all the 
all the rebellion and angsters on Snapchat. It's true. Do you guys don't don't think that there's any specific legacy of of Northern Virginia in terms of of punk rock or hardcore? I don't know. We're kind of like the neglected group out there throughout the years, like the stepchild of D.C. Like D.C.'s little brother. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was all, like Northern Virginia or even the southern, southern uh, Maryland scenes were all you know, overshadowed by the, what was happening in D.C. You know, because kids either moved to D.C. proper and got involved in music or they moved to elsewhere and got involved with music. You know, I think that's what Avail did. You know, like, they weren't. They didn't move to D.C. They all moved to Richmond, ironically enough. So, I went to Richmond and uh, played in a bunch of bands down there. And, you know, of note, probably it's a very low note, of course, but this band called Hotel X, which put out three records on SST Records, again, Greg Ginn of Black Flags label, uh, in the kind of '93, '94, '95, you know, way after you know SST's prime. And then I uh, went on to another band called Pelt, um, and we still play together. Uh, VHF Records was a big champion of ours. They're in Northern Virginia, based out of Burke. Um, and that's kind of like droney noise uh, kind of music, atmospheric, long tracks, you know, and it's varied from uh, electric guitars now to, to now where we do mostly acoustic performances. Um, but again, long format, kind of filmscape-esque type of song. And we, I've toured in Europe a bunch, uh, U.S. a bunch with that band over the last 30 years. Yeah, yeah. So the the thing that you know, and mo- that a lot most people are, a lot of people are familiar with that I did. Um, <clears throat> I started in Notre Dame. I started this band called Chisel with um, Ted Leo and a guy named Chris Infante on bass, and later a guy named Chris Norberg took over bass. But we started at Notre Dame and when we were uh, about a year after I finished Notre Dame, we kind of restarted the band in D.C. and did the band in D.C. for like uh, three and a half years or something and made <clears throat> made a couple records and released a bunch of singles and, and toured the country a few times. And uh, we toured with Velocity Girl. We toured with Fugazi. I mean, we, we it was great, you know, a, a great time to be and a great place to be active. Why don't we go walk and fall and walk? Well, I think we need to do something about your stuff. Well, why should I go walk and die your night? You got my money now, all you want's my smile. You way off base You want 
that was the main thing I did. I, I did, um, you know, in, in other bands, I, I'm trying to think. When after college, I also I did a band called Roller Coaster, and that, I guess that was technically be a northern Northern Virginia band, um, <clears throat> with a guy named Charles Bennington, who was in um, he was in Bloody Mannequin Orchestra and um, some other DC bands, and um, he was in Arlington at the time. So that was a I did some drumming with him. Um, whew, I filled in um, with Edsel for like a year, so I did some touring with them, made a record with them, um, and uh, that would have been like '94. Um, da, 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 what else? Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I, don't, I I did a few other things in the DC area before I moved to Chicago. I mean the the nine you know, the sort of nineteen nineties um I mean the music scene was kind of changing everywhere and, and the you know, D C was I mean it was it was a very uh you know, colorful, varied um like music scene at the time and we Chisel was funny in that we were sort of friendly with you know, some of our friends were working with Discord and some of our friends were working with Team Beat and we were working with a label in New Jersey and uh I don't know, I think it was yeah, it was kind of pretty wide wide open, open ended. I mean there were people were not necessarily career minded, but the people were very much like Yeah, I'm gonna sort of orient my life so I can go on tour for six weeks and maybe not, you know, ha- have any money to show for it. But, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it was kind of inspiring. It was also, you know, I think that for, um, as far as what was going on in the 90s as a whole, I think there was a lot of great music going on there that... <clears throat> should have been um, celebrated more or some of the bands should have been should have been a much bigger deal so you know I think we felt like oh this is this is a good place to be in a band and um, you could you could actually could go to New York and people were aware that DC was a pretty happening place and, and it so it was wasn't like um, it was you know it was kind of like a, a badge of honor and like people were were interested um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it, <clears throat> I got to say, I didn't necessarily pay quite as much attention to what was happening in Northern Virginia, like as a subset. But I think it was much more of just <clears throat> that DC and Northern Virginia and whatever bands that lived in suburban Maryland were all sort of one network at that time. I think there's, I think there's definitely. Um, a big question mark in terms of looking at some of the regional music scenes of the eighties, like why, you know, what, <clears throat> what set the, um, <clears throat> what set the stage for, you know, a music scene to take off and, and sort of, um, inspire people to make original music and art. I think that's always interesting to investigate. And, uh, I'd love, I'd, be very interested to hear what you sort of come up with in terms of Northern Virginia because I, I really don't know. Same, and I know. Same as a magic. 